Thank you, Simon and Daniel, for organizing it and inviting me. Uh, a little bit uh, introduction. I am, uh, my name is Yi, and I am a research scientist at Adobe. And my topic is about mesh convolution. Uh, this is a recent collaboration with research scientists from Facebook Reality Labs and a student and professor from USC. Uh, now let's start. In 3D animation, uh, there are a lot of registered mesh. Uh, what is registered mesh? Registered meshes are meshes with the same connectivity to have the same number and order of vertices and edges. So for example, in 3D human avatars, uh, usually people have a template mesh and fitted to all the scanned data. So all the data share the same topology, but each vertices have different deformation. And uh, it is often desired to learn a latent code to represent uh, the whole mesh. Traditionally, people use PCA method to do this. They use PCA to compress the mesh into a short uh, latent vector and then decompress it back to the original mesh so that they could manipulate the 3D mesh by just uh, manipulating the latent code. However, uh, the traditional PCA method is linear, so it has limited expressive capability, so it can lose details. And then people are thinking, could we apply deep neural networks on 3D meshes so we could have even better uh, mesh reconstruction results? Then the question is, how could we apply neural networks on meshes, uh, especially how could we use CNN on 3D meshes. A common practice is um, since we only have CNN defined on images, then in order to use it, people do the UV mapping to transform, uh, to map the 3D mesh to a 2D image, then use the traditional CNN to do the encoder and the decoder, and finally map the mesh from the UV space back to the 3D space. However, this type of method has several problems. First, it could have artifacts along the same lines and also have artifacts from distortion caused by the UV mapping. Second, uh, from experiment, we know that uh, if doing so, it ha will have very poor performance on reconstructing mesh with global shape deformation. And finally, more importantly, this method is not really elegant. The more elegant way is to find a mesh, a CNN that could de directly defined on 3D meshes. And this is the topic today. Um, so why we don't have a good CNN network on meshes? Because there are a lot of difficulties. The, so in a traditional CNN, the grid, no matter whether it is 1D or 2D or 3D, they are a regular uniform grid, which means at each local patch, uh, the structure is the same. So it has this shift invariance property. However, on a mesh, you can see that each local patch has different topology and the connectivity and the density, and it might even rotate on the whole 3D mesh. So then it's really hard to define a uniform kernel on a non-uniform mesh. In order to conquer this, a lot of people have investigated in this problem. And uh, I kind of classified all these previous methods into three categories. The first category is the spectral method, uh, but this method is kind of sometimes losing fidelity and it has the oscillation problem, so it is not always stable. Uh, and the, the more popular ones are, I call them feature condition method, uh, including the very popular neural network structures like graph attentional, uh, sorry, attentional, uh, anyway, graph attention network or a monet or fistnet. Um, so, Basically, this type of method is 
they say we don't know how to define the weight, but we could predict the weight weight on the in the kernel from the feature on the edge. Uh, but uh, so this the benefit of this method is it can apply on any type of graph. But the problem is it is very sensitive to big variations. So when the edge features changes, then the weight also changes. And from our following experiments, we found that these type of methods actually perform uh, not really well on reconstructing 3D structure. And uh, recently, there are some special methods designed uh, particularly for 3D surface meshes, like the spiral CNN, they define a spiral sequence on the local mesh. Um, but uh, it is kind of ad hoc and it is limited to the 2D manifold, but it achieves the state of the art uh, result. And also there are the edge CNM method. It is very elegant, very innovative, but it is very, very slow. Also it is limited to 2D manifold too, and uh, sometimes it loses geometry information. Mm. In order to solve all these problems and have a better CNN method, um, oh, sorry, I forgot this. So we only talk about uh, how to define the mesh operator, or the, oh, sorry, the convolution operator on mesh. But in practice, we also need to know how to do the up and the down scaling on the mesh. And uh, this is also a missing piece. Existing methods, basically there are just two methods. The first is you do the tradi very traditional quadric mesh simplification. So suppose all the meshes are registered, they just uh, find the, the template mesh and uh, do perform the traditional quadric mesh simplification algorithm on this mesh. Then you could get uh, the parameters for doing the simplification and the use this parameters for the whole training set. But the problem is it is overfitted to just one template mesh for the whole training set. Um, there are some, uh, and later there is in mesh CNN, this, so this work is called the mesh CNN, or everyone is mesh CNN, but this work is called itself mesh CNN. Um, they also introduced this dynamic edge collapsing so it's similar to the traditional one, but uh, it, there are some learning thing in it. And again, it is very slow and limited to 2D manifold. And also it has a minimal downscaling size requirements, which means you cannot just arbitrarily define how small you want to downsample the graph. Um, you cannot downsample it to any size you want. So, uh, in our project, uh, we want to address all these problems and define a really good mesh CNN network for 3D meshes. Our insight is um, a mesh could be seen as a discretization of a continuous space. Uh, sorry, I need to close the window. Okay, I'm back. So a mesh is a discretization of a continuous space. And assume if we can define a continuous kernel to be shared in a continuous space, then we can define the discretized kernel that is sampled from this shared continuous kernel. But the sampling function has to be defined per vertex locally because each local patch looks different. Um, then le let's look at uh, this patch. Uh, the blue vertices are the input vertices of a graph in a local patch. And uh, when doing a convolution filter, oh sorry, the Y is the output vertices. And when doing the convolution filter, uh, Y is computed as the integration of the features on X uh, weighted by some uh, coefficients or let's say matrices defined on the edge. But uh, as we talked about it, uh, 
uh, it's hard to define the, the weights because the local structure is irregular. However, we can imagine uh, there is a regular grid at each local patch. And on this imaginary regular grid, we can imagine there are some weight bases, which are blue dots here defined on this grid so that uh, the real weight are actually scattered in this area and they can be interpolated by the weight basis. So during training, we actually can say that these weight bases can be shared through the whole uh, mesh or the whole graph. However, the weight, the real weight, because they are interpolated by those weight bases and uh, the distribution are different at each local patch. So the integration coefficients should be different and also should be trained, be learned through training. Then we can define our convolution operation. It is very simple. So B are the kernel bases, these uh, green dots. Uh, and A are the interpolation coefficients. The weight W could be computed by the integration of the weight bases with the inter interpolation coefficients A. And the output feature is computed as just as regular convolution kernel, uh, convolution operator, which is the aggregation of the input features weighted, uh, multiplied with the, the weights on each edges plus the bias. And uh, in this case, both the basis B and the coefficients A are learned through training. Uh, then we all should also define a pooling operation. Um, the observation is similar. So we can see that the local density is non-uniform. So traditional in a regular CNN network, uh, the, the pooling operation is just uh, average pooling or max pooling with the same weights. But uh, in this case, we should uh, be aware that the density is actually different at, for each vertices at each local patch. So a better way is to a Monte Carlo integration, but the problem is it's really hard to define the density in each local region so that we say that we also want to learn these density coefficients through training instead of doing some manual defini definition. Uh, and the formulation then is very simple. So rho is the density coefficients and the, the pooling operation is just uh, uh, the sum of the input features weighted by the coefficients and the coefficients are learned through training. We have a quick uh, question by Daniel, yeah. which is asking, uh, does NI always have the same number of elements? Uh, sorry, I? NI, the number uh, of uh, the neighborhood. Oh, no, it's different. Uh, the, the neighborhood number is different. So in practice, while I coding this part, uh, I will first uh, find the maximum neighborhood number so that I'll compute a mask for the neighborhood. So in order to, to compute this uh, in parallel, you can, uh, so I define a matrix with the size of the maximum number of vertices and also, uh, sorry, the maximum number of neighbors and also have uh, somehow, it's not really using mask, but uh, you can, right now you can just uh, thinking about having also a mask indicating this neighborhood really exists. If it exists, it's one, if not, it's zero. Uh, I didn't really uh, implement it in this way, but, but you can just think about it like this. Mm. Okay, now we defined the operator. Then we can talk about how to down, do the down and up sampling. 
uh, we previously mentioned that uh, we don't want this up and down sampling overfitted to the template feature. So uh, that's why we design it only based on the graph connectivity. So for example, in this case, this is the original graph uh, or the, let's say the input graph. Uh, one can define the stride to sample the graph and also define the radius to, for the convolution or the pooling kernel. And the upsampling progress uh, is just the reverse version of the downsampling. But the only difference is you can, so the stride should be the same, but the radius could be different. And uh, this is uh, actually very similar to the traditional CNN up and down sampling scheme, just that it is defined on graph, not on a regular grid. And you can see that uh, with all these operators and up and down sampling scheme, we actually provide all the operations analog to a traditional CNN. We have the, so we call it VC convolution. Uh, it's, uh, we have convolution and the transpose convolution operators with stride, with kernel radius, uh, and uh, also you can define dilation, you can define the in-channel and out-channel of it. Uh, uh, and you can also define the pooling and the unpooling layer with stride. Uh, and uh, with all these operators, it's very easy for you to also define a residual block for the network. And the residual network is just like uh, any traditional residual network. Uh, it has the transpose or convolution, convolution, uh, sorry, operators and uh, the, the activation function and has to release the transformation with pulling or unpulling for the residual part. Uh, okay, now we have everything we had, we want, then we can use these operators to design the autoencoder for the default uh, for a real case. So this real this case is uh, from default data set. Uh, this is the default data set. It contains uh, roughly 7,000 vertices on the original mesh. And uh, we use four residual blocks to encode it to a graph with only seven vertices. And for each vertex, uh, it has a channel of nine, uh, it has the latent vector of nine channels. And uh, then we use the upsampling residual block to decode it back to the original mesh with four layers. And uh, um, a more interesting thing is that uh, when doing this, you can see that the latent uh, vertices in the, ver the, in the middle layer it's kind of similar to the skeleton of the human mesh. And the receptive field of each latent vertices is propagated from the center of the vertices to uh, smoothly to the other part of the body. So you can see the, this, vertex is, this vertex is mainly responsible for the arm and this is uh, like this one is mainly responsible for the head. However, if you use some other method like the quadric mesh simplification method, you lose this nice property. You don't have a very ideal central graph and uh, the latent, uh, the, the receptive field is kind of uh, not, it kind of discontinue, discontinues. For example, this vertex, it is on the head but it is also responsible for the arm. Now let's see the results. Uh, first, we experiment uh, our network on the default data set and compare it uh, with um, a lot of uh, state-of-the-art graph or mesh CNN method. And you can see that ours has the best performance. And here is a video. Uh, Neuros 3D MM, it used the spiral convolution uh, kernel and uh, it was the state of the art method on 3D human shape. But ours, you can see, has even better performance than it. Um, 
and uh, more interestingly, so uh, different from all these other methods, we also have the capability of doing the interpolation with the localized uh, latent uh, vertices. So in this case, we have man A and man B. We first are using our encoder to get the latent vertices of man A and man B. Then we use this blue vertex, latent vertices of man A and the red vertices, vertex of man B and feed them into the decoder and generate a new man A. So in here, you can see that uh, now the new man A has the same lag post as man B, but it's not exactly the lag of man B. Man B is slimmer than man A, but the new man A's left leg is kind of preserved the shape of its original size. Uh, so it can not only, so this network can reconstruct uh, just uh, any type of features defined on the vertices. So it can also reconstruct uh, geometry. And uh, in, in this example, we train the network on a high resolution 3D hand data set. And you can see that it can reconstruct uh, the hand pretty well. Yeah, this is the result on the test site. Uh, we also do the localized interpolation on the hand example. Uh, when we train the hand data set, uh, uh, the latent vertices are defined on the tip of each finger and on the wrist. And in this case, we have a source mesh like this and the target mesh like this. Traditionally, people can only do the global interpolation, but uh, with our network, we can interpolate uh, uh, not only for the whole hand, but also interpolate uh, the finger we want. Yeah. Uh, and remember, I have efficient in the title of this talk. So this network is actually also very efficient. It costs uh, not really high memory and it runs pretty fast. So with this feature, uh, this network can be applied on mesh with really high resolution. So in this uh, experiment, uh, we trained the network on the data set with each mesh contains 153,000 vertices and you can see it reconstructed the details well although it loses some, but uh, overall it is good. You can see this looks like veins and bones and also look at these um, wrinkles at the lag. Um, another benefit of this network is it can not like um, some other mesh CNN network that can only work on surface mesh. It can work on basically any graph. So one example is the tetrahedron mesh. The tetrahedron mesh is the type of mesh that are usually used for simulation tasks. Uh, basically, uh, for uh, you, can, you can construct a tet mesh and uh, do some heavy simulation competition on it so that the, the tet mesh could move, could deform and drive the deformation of a fine surface mesh inside it. And we also train the network on it and see the result. Um, also, uh, a good thing is, you know, a lot of meshes in the wild, that they might not really be manifold mesh. They have some local non-manifold structures. And even with those type of structures, our network still won't fail. And uh, here is an example on training on a tree. Yeah, so that's all the results I want to share. And uh, you can find uh, the full version of all the videos on my personal 
uh, website, you can find the project page and you click in it and you see the link to the code, to the paper and all these videos. Um, then finally, let's talk about future work. Uh, I draw this uh, graph. So the horizontal line is about reconstruction accuracy and the, the vertical line is about uh, flexibility. Uh, so you can see that a very popular mesh CN, uh, sorry, graph CNN method like a G, a graph attention network, a feast network, a moon net, they have very good flexibility. They can work on arbitrary graph with unfixed connectivity, but uh, their performance for reconstruction is not really good. And there is also this mesh CNN, it actually used the uh, uh, edge convolution kernels. So uh, it can work on unfixed connectivity on, on, gra uh, on, on a mesh with unfixed connectivity, but it is limited to surface mesh. And the recent work like Coma and the Neuro3D uh, Neuro MM, they have much more limitation on the flexibility. They can only work on mesh with fixed connectivity and it only uh, works for 2D surface mesh. But uh, it, they improve the performance uh, in terms of reconstruction accuracy um, quite a lot compared to these more flexible methods. And ours even push the push further about on the accuracy and has the the highest accuracy and the precision, uh, but so you can, and ours can work on arbitrary graph and don't have limitation on surface mesh, but the problem is uh, you can see it is uh, only uh, limit, it can only work on fixed connect, on meshes with fixed connectivity. Although fixed connect meshes with connectivity is very commonly used in 3D animation, but uh, for more general cases, people will still want to have a mesh CNN for unfixed, uh, for unfixed graphs. So it's very clear that uh, in the future, uh, we need to find a way to design a network that has both higher accuracy and high flexibility. So, okay, this is my talk today and I hope it could has the chance to uh, benefit in some of your works too. Any questions? <laughs>